Hi, this is Yevhen Matyushenko, and you're watching our recap of this tense week's news as we stand strong here in the heart of Ukraine. Okay, top news this week was Russian invasion that Western intelligence agencies suggested could kick off on Wednesday, February 16th. Well, the early warning, or exposure, seems to have worked, and no Russian bombs were dropped on Ukrainian cities that night. Some international media outlets, however, were all set to cover the incursion from the ground, and some even set up a live stream from Kyiv's magnificent Maidan Square, showing an illuminated independence column in a generally calm city center. For me personally, the top moment of the entire stream was when a small drone flew up to the camera carrying a handcrafted sign with a short ad. Garage for sale in Solomonsky district, the sign said. Really, how about a bit of humor during these tense hours, someone might have thought. The joke had another layer though. It turns out that the contact phone in the ad is that of a Russian embassy located in the said district. You know, there's a trait so characteristic of Ukrainians in times of stress. People tend to laugh it off. After all, if you can't change what's coming, you just have fun and live on with your life. Tons of memes and jokes have emerged over the past weeks related to the invasion threat, and they all seem to help keep our spirits up. Also, a reassuring message to the nation is being spread including through big boards set up across Ukrainian cities. The army will keep you safe, 4-5-0, which is a military code for all is calm. Such messages calling for the public to not succumb to panic, which would be so pleasing to the Kremlin's eye, are truly important in the wake of reports of some foreign diplomats being told to evacuate from the country. Meanwhile, the U.S. Embassy has relocated to the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. All right. I never said local hotels and apartments for rent were dirt cheap, but come on guys, you're not helping. Just kidding, enjoy your stay. Lviv is rightly one of the most outstanding landmarks in Ukraine. The diplomats have already thanked local officials for hosting them in what they called a beautiful city. Meanwhile, the chess game the Russians are playing is becoming more and more complicated. The State Duma this week voted to appeal to their president, Vladimir Putin, to recognize as independent republics the self-proclaimed entities in eastern Ukraine, the so-called DPR and LPR. Perhaps this way they're further raising stakes, as if to warn Ukraine's western partners that their next move could be to deploy Russian troops there. But this, in turn, would mean that Russia would unilaterally withdraw from the Minsk agreements and finally stop hiding behind their ridiculous we-are-not-there claims. On the other hand, this would also relieve Ukraine of any obligations it undertook under the deal and no further steps will have to be made in the political plane, including any changes to the Constitution. So how, however, it seems that Mr. Putin isn't too willing to approve the appeal and move on with the recognition. The Russian leader said that the Ukraine settlement should move along the lines of the Minsk Accords. On the eve of what was believed to be the date of a Russian incursion, Ukrainian national banks and the websites of the Armed Forces and Defense Ministry were hit in a cyber attack. I wonder who was behind it? Anyway, the bank's web services were down for a couple of hours while a denial-of-access attack made the websites unavailable. Soon enough, including with the help of our Western partners, public access to these resources was restored, probably much to the disappointment of those Russian hackers. Come on, guys, you still got homework to do. And stop disappointing your GRU teachers so bad. Shame on you. Joe Biden, in his address concerning Ukraine tensions this week, turned to average Russians. We're not targeting the people of Russia. We do not seek to destabilize Russia. To the citizens of Russia, you are not our enemy, and I do not believe you want a bloody, destructive war against Ukraine, a country and a people with whom you share such deep ties of family, history, and culture. See, the American president well recognizes something that the Kremlin has been insisting on when spreading its narratives about the one people of Russia and Ukraine. And that thing is 
There are indeed deep historical ties between the two nations, and all it took to destroy that all was Vladimir Putin's stubborn will to subdue Ukraine and make it Russia's obedient satellite with no self-identity. Won't work for us, sorry. Not sorry. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with a Russian leader in Moscow in an effort to contribute to de-escalation around Ukraine. He has directly brought up the issue of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in connection with the possible sanctions to be imposed should Russia decide to further invade Ukraine. I just wonder if Putin heard Schultz correctly. You know, social distancing and all that. Nord Stream 2 kaputt. Nord Stream 2 gut? Alles gut? Perhaps Emmanuel Macron had the same problem in Moscow. Did you see that desk? Did you see that? By the way, there's one Swedish company that could consider a new item to its stock, someone on the internet suggested. Human rights in the temporarily occupied Crimea are a thing of the past. The Russian-controlled court in Simferopol sentenced a Ukrainian journalist, Vladislav Yesipenko, who used to do freelance work for RFERL's Crimea Realities Project, to six years in a maximum security prison. The authorities have accused him of espionage in the interests of Ukraine. Apparently, being a journalist and cooperating with a media outlet that Russia recognizes as a foreign agent automatically implies you're a spy and could land you behind bars. Ukraine's ombudsperson Lyudmila Denisova condemned the verdict. The sentence is an example of intimidation of independent journalists, suppression of freedom of thought in the temporarily occupied Crimea, and yet another evidence of the policy of persecution and reprisals against Ukrainian citizens committed by the occupying power. On February 16th, the date that drew so much international attention for a reason far from pleasant, Ukraine celebrated the Day of Unity. Addressing the nation, as well as the country's foreign partners, Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba tweeted, United, Ukrainians always prevail. As the nation celebrates the unity of all Ukrainians at home and abroad, this is also Ukraine's unity with reliable partners proven by the security crisis created by Russia. The top diplomat expressed gratitude to the true friends of Ukraine who stand by us not only in words but also in deeds. Speaking of friends, Liz Truss, British Foreign Secretary, visited Kyiv this Thursday. Speaking alongside his British counterpart, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Kuleba said Ukraine, Britain and Poland have formalized a new trilateral format of cooperation, of which the parties spoke earlier. Poland and Great Britain will help us defend our country, the head of Ukrainian diplomacy told journalists. On Thursday, Russia reacted to US and NATO's response to Moscow's draft of security guarantees. Overall, it seems Russia is closing the window for dialogue. In the absence of readiness of the American side to agree on firm, legally binding guarantees to ensure our security on the part of the United States and its allies, Russia will be forced to respond, including through the implementation of military technical measures, the document says. This means, literally, that the threat of war hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, it has become more acute. To de-escalate tensions, Russia demands the following. Coerce Ukraine to fulfill the Minsk agreements in a way Mother Russia sees them. Seize all arms supplies to Ukraine and recall all weapons already delivered. Also, we want all foreign military instructors and advisors out of Ukraine. And yes, cancel all joint exercises of Ukraine's army and NATO allies. So this will bring de-escalation, Russia claims. Of course it will, for Russia. They will just then be able to move into our poorly armed Ukraine and take whatever they want, with lower risk for their troops. Doesn't seem to be a fair game to me. On a lighter note, Ukraine's national selection for this year's Eurovision Song Contest has almost pushed Russian invasion off top agenda among many Ukrainians. However, this time, the selection turned somewhat ugly. Alina Pash won the selection with an entry titled Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors and was set to represent the nation at the show that traditionally draws millions of viewers across the country. But then came a shocker as it turned out the singer violated a red line set in Ukraine for artists 
wanting to represent the country at the ESC. The thing is, it appears she visited the occupied Crimea in breach of Ukrainian law. So, what Team Alina Paz did was file with the organizers a certificate allegedly issued by border guards that refuted the allegation. In a short while, the authorities came out with an official statement no such certificate has ever been issued. Do I hear someone whisper, fraud? Anyway, Alina Pash withdrew from the contest, and for the moment, it remains unclear who will eventually sink for Ukraine at the ESC 2022. The events are unfolding ever so rapidly, so tune in next week to get a glimpse of what's happening in the country amid turbulence around its borders. This is Ukraine Forum in the heart of Ukraine.